Hey, everybody, welcome. Welcome to our grief chat. So you guys, my name is Casey Starlong, and I'm so glad that you are here today. And so God just put on my heart to do a series of conversations all about grief. Um, if you are like me, you have been really surrounded by grief. Um, this has just been what a season with this pandemic. This has been just such a season, but nevertheless, God is good. Um, but God just had began putting on my heart just about having really authentic, real conversations about how do we as Christians approach grief? How do we embrace grief? What does grief look like? Unmasked. And uh, so there are just a couple of people that God has highlighted. And so I am just asking them questions and we are just having a conversation. So you can see the crawler on the screen. Our guest, her name is Sonia McClendon and uh, she and I and my husband and her husband, we've attended church, uh, the same church for a couple of years. And I have just had the opportunity to watch her walk through grief. And so I invited her here to just share with us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring up Sonia so we can have this conversation about grief. And so, hey, Sonia, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Val. So you hey, Casey, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I know you recently had a birthday and yes. um, today has been kind of a whirlwind for you with getting things ready for today's interview. But for those that may not know you, just tell just tell us a little bit about you. Well, uh, my, I'm uh, born again, of course, um, licensed and ordained, have been for like over 15 years. I came, I'm with the Shalom Church, associate minister with the Shalom Church, one of the associate ministers. And uh, I came from a long, line of ministers and deacons and evangelists. So I have a rich inheritance and foundation in Christian Christianity. Yeah. So, and we're, we'll definitely talk a little bit about, you know, just kind of your background because I had the real opportunity to um, see you kind of walk, walk grief out um, with the loss of your son. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want to talk about with you today. You okay over there? Yes, this phone. He this phone rang. That's out. That's okay. I probably should leave it off. So it, go ahead. Okay. Let's go. So I wanted to just kind of share with you. I want to just kind of have a conversation with you about the the passing, you know, of your son. Um, and you know, you're here talking about grief and what grief looks like with losing a child. Um, mm -hmm. so just tell us a little bit about what your grief experience has been like. Let me just say my grief experience has been for him like no other prior previous. I had, um, notions that it was coming. I was taking care of my mom. I was taking care of my dad. I took care of an elderly lady. So I, it was, it was imminent. But then for my son to take a flight, it just like, out of just, he just took flight and went, never opened his eyes again, never had any idea it was coming. So it was like a shocker. It was numb. I didn't, I just know what I know. Move and go with what I know. And that, that is God is present, a present help in a time of need. That's where I was. And so I just moved in it. I cannot tell you how. I, some said, how did you do that? I even gave the eulogy of my son, but I figured, I knew him better than anybody. So what better person to eulogize him? God stood up in me and allowed me and helped me, prepared me for that eulogy. Yeah. You know, I believe that God highlights people in our lives for us to observe. Mm -hmm. And you were you are one of those people. Um, I haven't had children yet. 
um, haven't encountered uh, big moments of grief. I lost my father. Um, but I believe that God has highlighted you as a person for me to watch. Oh, it looks like we lost <laughs> Sonia. Um, we looks like we lost, lost Sonia. So hopefully you guys that she'll come back and uh, we'll be able to continue the conversation with her. Um, but one of the things about really grief is um, I believe that, you know, sometimes God shows us different people to watch and to observe and to see how they are doing things. Um, and I believe that God used Sonia as an example for me. Uh, one of the things that Sonia talked about is that she eulogized her son. And I remember being in the audience at the funeral for her son. And, you know, one of the things that Sonia talked about, she said, I feel like I could just scream. And, you know, I appreciated just her authenticity that here she was in the pulpit, you know, with her Bible ready to, you know, um, share the word of God, ready to talk about the life of her son. But this moment of humanness and authenticity, she said, look, I feel like I could scream. And, you know, one of the things about really having these conversations about grief, um, especially as believers is for us to feel comfortable with our humanness that, you know, God has not created us as robots. He hasn't created us as, you know, 10 men and women without a heart. Um, but there's this process where we need to really become comfortable and embrace grief for what it is, not to stay stuck there, but to really rest and say, you know what, that this is grief. And I feel like during this moment, I want to scream and then giving yourself permission to scream. For those of you guys that are just now joining us, we were having a conversation with Sonia McClendon. She's a minister. She's a wife. She's a mother. She's a grandmother. She recently celebrated her birthday. We were having a conversation. It looks like she got kicked off. So hopefully she will be able to join us again. Um, but one of the things that God has placed on my heart with hosting these grief series, these conversations about grief is really to unmask grief, uh, to not be afraid of grief, to not be ashamed of grief. And most importantly, as believers, to be honest when we are grieving. I don't know about you, but, you know, I am noticing friends who are, you know, walking through what it means to, to grieve and, and are dealing with the loss of loved ones. And, um, you know, really, you know, having a level of compassion and sympathy. And so that's why I wanted to have this conversation about grief to really unmask it and really be able to talk about it with those that have gone through the, the loss of a husband or the loss of a child and for them to share authentically how they how they went through it. What did it look like for them? I want to take a, a look at some scriptures because um, you know, some of the things that have comforted me about grief is what the word of God says. And as we wait for Sonia to, to join us again, okay, she's sending me a message. Let me just reply to her. Okay. All right. Um, and so as we wait for Sonia to come back, there are just a couple of scriptures that I just want to share because I think that they are important for us to know what the word of God says about grief. And, uh, you know, one of the one of my favorite scriptures is and this is the words of Jesus where he says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And so I want to encourage you that if you find yourself in a, in a time of grieving, you know, that God says, Jesus says, look, blessed are you who mourn that you will be comforted. And, you know, this scripture, it really encourages me because these are the words of Jesus where he's letting us know that you are blessed as you mourn for they shall be comforted. And I really think that a tactic of the enemy is for us to bypass grief. I shared a little bit with our guest yesterday, Roy King Jackson, who talked about grieving the loss of his mother. And uh, he mentioned that initially, his job had given him about five days off of bereavement time. And he went back to work and he realized that that was not long enough. And so he was able to take more time. 
I think about myself when my dad passed away. It was, I was, I was 28 at the time. My father had passed away unexpectedly, kind of like uh, Sonia's son passed away um, unexpectedly without notice. And for me, I was intentional. I did not really want to grieve. I, I, was, I was okay with crying at the funeral, crying a little bit here and there. But the idea of just resting and sitting in the grief, I was unwilling to do because I was afraid. And so one of the things that I think is really important is, is that God wants us to embrace that time, that there is a, there is a season for everything. And, and, and there's a season for grief. And so being okay with just sitting in that grief, acknowledging it for what it is. I feel broken on the inside. I feel lost. I feel afraid. Because here, here's what happens if you don't do that. If you refuse to allow yourself time to really sit in that grief, if you refuse to acknowledge your humanness, then what happens is, is that grief, it's going to come out in other ways in your life. It'll come out in anger. It'll come out in bitterness. It'll come out really in works of the flesh, bad habits. And so you want to really focus in on that and allow yourself to grieve. I was having a conversation uh, with my with my therapist and we were actually talking about grief and I was saying to her and I was explaining to her that, you know, the idea of grieving it is something that brings fear to me. Like that's why I didn't want to just sit in grief at the age of 28. Why? Because it hurts. Because it hurts. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times, especially as leaders and as Christians, it's just so easy for us to just say, oh, you know, I'm a pray. God is good. Glory to God. You know, let me I'm moving on to do the, the, the work of God. But what happens is, is if we don't ever acknowledge that, then we're never able to really be healed. And also we're never, ever really able to see God work in our lives. There's a scripture that talks about that the God of all comfort, he comforts us when we need it. And then we are able to comfort others. And so if we're not allowing that time for God to comfort us, if we're not allowing God, you know, if we're not allowing that time for us to mourn, you know, then we aren't receiving the blessing <laughs> and we aren't really able to see that the handprint of God um, I believe that, you know, some of the greatest examples about grief are people who are able to say, like Sonia, she was talking before she got interrupted, that, you know, God is what pulled her through, that the spirit of God allowed her. The spirit of God was raised up on the inside of her where she was able to eulogize her son. So I'm going to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to continue to just be part of these grief conversations. I'm going to try to contact Sonia and see maybe we do a part two um, at some point today or maybe later on this evening. But I want to challenge you. Um, I want to challenge you to, to be present for these conversations. Um, I'll, I'll check in with Sonia to see if we can get her back on and kind of figure out the techno technical um, pieces with her on her end. But if you um, have walked through grief, if you have a story, that you want to share, I want to encourage you to email me because I'm just looking to have these conversations. All right, let's have some conversations. So if you've overcome grief or maybe you're in the process of um, walking out grief, I want you to contact me and you and I, we can talk and, you know, maybe we'll use this as a format. And, you know, one of the other things is, is that, you know, there are different types of grief. Uh, my husband, he will be with us on Friday. So he's going to be one of our guests and uh, he's going to be talking about grieving, um, but not necessarily grieving the loss of a loved one, but grieving what once was. And so there are all different types of grieving. I see Sonia is back. So I'm going to bring her in and we are just going to move forward with continuing the conversation. So Sonia, before before we got disconnected, you were sharing how um, God's spirit 
rose up on the inside of you and you were able to eulogize your son. But I want to go mm -hmm. back a little bit. OK, tell us who your son was and tell us the date of his passing. Kirk Douglas Binion. Kirk Douglas Binion. He was born. Uh, he died on May 9th, 2019. Uh, 56 years old, born September 9, 1962. Kirk was uh, well known. My goodness, I didn't even know the legend he was. He had friends from all over. Very well known and a lovable, likable guy. Loved life, loved entertainment. He was an entertainment broker. He was just, uh, he was just um, a single man never had that person to nag him to take care of his health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, I think I ended somewhere along the line in my eulogy, men, because men normally, those are the ones that normally won't do the thing. They don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to hear what the doctor has to say, or they don't want to follow it. He stopped taking his medicine and he just left me so suddenly. And it was just numbing. I, I had a guilt trip this morning. I know you didn't ask me all this, but this morning I kind of thought I was listening or reading something that was talking about how they hear the last, that's one of the last, that's the last thing to go. And so even in the hospital and standing around the bed and standing and talking, did we say anything or too much? My son, Buford, his youngest, his brother, is is tripping really over the fact that it appears Kirk did not fight for his life. It, it appears that he just gave up. And uh, so that's what kind of got to me today. And I just had to slam something. Um, but I mean, he had, he was so popular with out going out and, and socializing and, uh, restaurant owners and bands. He was in a band for, he traveled to uh, Greenland for 10 years. He was in a band. He was the first chair in the drum section at Tennessee State. Um, he was very, very popular even with his professors. And uh, so I could go on and on about him, but it is so much that I could say but I did not realize the legacy that he left uh, with people. Uh, he never met a stranger. The week before he, the week before he had his stroke, he was at the park, just walking through the park with his cell phone, talking to people and just engaging and talking about how he had given away. He's always given away. I found the Bible at his house, well, many Bibles, but this particular one, he had money in there because I think he would give dollars. He was very active in his church, but he didn't find a church where he planted his feet for long. Things happened that he would move on. So, so but he you know, was very, very, um, go ahead. One of the things that um, I just want to, and I'm trying to share this on your page because some of your friends are asking me, they want to be able to see this conversation. So I'm multitasking, but that's okay because this is just a conversation. Um, but one of the things is, uh, Sonia, that I want to talk about because you mentioned, you said you had to slam something today. Mm -hmm. So your son, um, he's, he's, he's passed away over a year ago, but mm -hmm. you're still grappling with that. Can you just talk about what that looked like today where you felt like I need to just slam something? Well, I was sitting, uh, just sitting on the side of the bed thinking about this interview and have been thinking about this for over a week. And just things just, I was just thinking like I, my son and I had a uh, conversation a couple of days ago and he was saying, man, I just cannot see why Kirk didn't fight. And then I started thinking about talking and maybe I didn't say anything or I, I whispered in his ear and I tried to talk, but I was just thinking, did I do something? Did I fail him even in those last moments where I might have, I mean, you know, could he have rejuvenated, regrabbled and come up out of it or what? I just felt like 
I, I guess I had a guilt trip or something, but I just hit something, you know, and it's just a feeling that comes over you. You don't, you can't explain it. You just know that it's there. And the release is if I just hit, hit, scream, I just hit the book. I was look. I had the Bible in my lap and I was reading something and I just, bam, hit it. I'll come in here and hit the wall because his, his little, little memorial is here. I have his, his urn and his picture and I have all his, a little red sports car and uh, a band, a full band up there in that area where he's, and I walk there sometimes and pray, but it's just, um, it's just a feeling. You cannot explain it. It just, yeah. you just feel it. And I try to replace that feeling with good stuff. I try to replace it with good things that happen, you know? And uh, so it, you know, I, I don't know. That's well, just what happened this morning. I just had to hit something. And I love that because that's real. And mm -hmm. that's what this is all about, having authentic conversations. And I think we do a disservice if we're not being honest, like we, we, you know what I'm saying? We could put like the praise the Lord, hallelujah. And, and yeah. we do that too. But sometimes in the middle, in the midst, it's been just a little bit over a year, a year and a half. And there's still that grief or rage. I mentioned um, that during the eulogy, you talked about, I just feel like I could scream. Mm -hmm. That's what you say. You know, I, I feel like I could just scream. And so one of the questions that I, that I have for you is uh, what did grief look like for you immediately after you found that your son had passed away? Numbness. Just numb. Um, unbelief. No questioning. Just, just numbness. I just couldn't believe it. And I, it was so weird the way they found me because he didn't have any identity except a driver's license and his insurance card and his wallet, keys, those kind of things. He didn't have phone in his phone, I guess he they could have they couldn't access it because it's passcode. But they found me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. The nurse practitioner, um, Looked on Facebook, found him. I think that picture that you showed, mm -hmm. or something like that, and he mm -hmm. had written there, "My number one, my mom." So then they found me and called me that Tuesday. He had the stroke on Sunday, so they found me on Tuesday, and I'm just like, they said the doctor needs to see you right away out here, and I didn't even know where the hospital was out in Fenton. And I told my husband, we got to go. Uh, Kurt, they want to talk to me about Kurt. So you said that your initial feeling was numbness. Just numb. Just numb. Yeah. I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Couldn't believe it. And when does that numbness wear off? Or does it? It doesn't wear off. It subsides, so to speak. It's not as prevalent as always it doesn't just keep you on that same level of high or or just disbelief mm -hmm. and so it kind of goes kind of settles and you're able to talk about it and i i talk about it sometimes i talk and i say i guess you guys are didn't, don't want to hear this now but i can't help it you got to listen to me and i'll talk about it i talk about it to get that heaviness off me. I talk about good times. I talk about things that made me happy about him, things that he did that I was so proud of. There was a time when he went to Tennessee State, and of course, he was so in love with, he was so in love with um, the um, drum line, because that movie reminded him so much of himself. When he got to Tennessee State, of course, there was someone else in that first chair. And he wanted that first chair. And Professor told him, if you stay with me this summer, you can come back next. Well, why don't, 
<laughs> if you stay with me and um, come back, you can come back in the fall and take that chair. And he did that. Yeah. And we were proud of him. Right. So, so it, yeah, it sounds like, you know, um, even in the midst of the kicking, punching, all of that, the numbness that subsides, um, one of the ways that you cope is by really thinking about the good times. I want to know, has like this COVID-19 with the quarantine, I know that you haven't been able to um, enjoy church like you normally would. Mm -hmm. um, how has COVID-19 impacted uh, your grief? Well, you know what? It hasn't really. It's just kind of, it makes me more, um, it hasn't changed anything that much because I still uh, interact with the church and everything by long stream, by stream, but it's just the prayer and the meditative, uh, the meditative positions are that you find yourself in. And um, so I just, I keep my Bible right here on this couch by me and I sit there and I read it. But I'll say this, during this COVID and all of this busyness or craziness, I have been blessed to mentor others. And I had one of the deacons actually called me and said, Minister, I really would like for you to be my prayer partner. Wow. So God sends, see how he fills that gap. Mm -hmm. And I said, me, you want me to be your prayer? He said, you're a prayer warrior. I want you and your husband and you're a prayer warrior. And I need you to pray for me. And he said, is it all? And I'm going to, he called me every Wednesday. And I didn't call him because he was on machines and that kind of stuff. And I didn't know. But that's how the, the COVID has enhanced my ability to cope because I've been able to take mine off me and put it on someone else. That's the best, the best way that you can come out of your is to put your mind on someone else, is to begin to pray for somebody else. This gentleman would call me and he wanted me to pray with him and he called me and encouraged me. Mm -hmm. So it's that it's that void that God feels in your life. If you let, he will come to you, send people to you, but you've got to be receptive and you've got to let him help you yeah. come through these things. You know, that that brings me to mind something that uh, my therapist actually was saying. And she talked about that with grieving, you know, something is lost, like your mm -hmm. your son is lost. Mm -hmm. But God <laughs> brings other people into your life. And like mm -hmm. you said, you have to be willing to accept mm -hmm. that because mm -hmm. you could just be like, I don't want it. I want mm -hmm. my son. I, you know what I'm saying? I'm not open <laughs> to any type of replacement. But it sounds like, you know, just really surrendering to the will of God and saying, OK, God, I, I miss my son, but I see how you are you are taking care of me in other ways. And rocking me right on through that thing with giving me situations that were worst off. I, they were I was they were worse off than I. This mm -hmm. gentleman was very, very ill, but he still had enough in him to call that phone and to to talk to me and witness to me. Yeah. So it's how it's how I just really truly believe that I believe that God see where he sees and he knows all and he knows what we need and he has that very person there for you. I had a young woman come to me at church and ask me. She said I've seen you and I just want to know because she was going through with her son and I just want to know minister how did you do it how are you able to do it mm -hmm. she was her son had been killed in a car accident just decapitated and she said i hear your name on the prayer list every three weeks but you seem to still maintain but it's not me it's jesus it's god that's in me 
So because I choose to not languish on that thing. Okay, that's it. Because you've said this a couple of times that it's God in you, and so I want I want to I want to talk about that word choose. Mm -hmm. You say you choose to allow God to rise up in you and give you strength. What does that look like? How does someone say, okay, God, I'm going to let, I'm going to allow you to, to give me strength. What does that look like, Sonia? It just, it, it looks like submission. It looks like, I mean, you can make your mouth say anything. I can say, yea, though I walk through the valley. I can say he'll be with you always. I can make my mouth say all those things. But if I don't allow it and have and happen and give up. You got to give up. You just got to give up. You cannot think you can operate in this thing yourself. You got to submit just as the word says, submit to him. And you know, uh, I know someone hearing it and seeing it might say, well, yeah, I guess you can say that, but do you really? Yes, you really have to. That's the only way. God knocks. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you let me in, I'll come in and sup with you. And there's a picture. I talk about that all the time, even in the prison, when I talk to them about that. That knob is not on my side of the door. He's on, the knob is over here. Mm -hmm. It's not over there where Jesus is knocking. Mm -hmm. You got to submit. That's what it looks like to me. It submit. It looks like total release. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself angry at God? I know now you're talking about like the submission and, and you know, you, you said that you've chosen to allow God. But was there any moment where you were like, come on, God, like for real? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Never had a moment. I never did. I never had a moment of anger. I just have um, I just continue to have moments of disbelief and he had so much I thought to live for, but I never, I, I didn't get angry. I just, just didn't get angry. Yeah. I Isn't miss him. My goodness, I miss him. This birthday, there would have been, he would have been there with a card and uh, beautiful vases. I have so many vases in here with beautiful arrangements of flowers. And do you know, Believe it or not, last, the year after he passed on, I found a card in my purse that he had given me that I had not opened. And I, that felt like that was him coming, saying, Mom, I'm all right, and you're all right. Yeah. I remember you sharing that on Facebook, and I thought that mm -hmm. was so special, mm -hmm. that, that that was God, that after your yeah. son had passed, you looked and you saw a card that he had given you previously mm -hmm. that you had never opened. And never opened. I remember you saying that you were going to save it. So you mm -hmm. And I it. stuck it back in there and it had a financial blessing in it. I still didn't take it out. I put it right back in that card. I was so dumbfounded when I opened it. Oh my God. Shut it back up and put it back. Don't even remember which purse I put it in, mm -hmm. but I'll stumble up on it again. And I always feel like when I stumble up on it, it's not stumbling up on it. It's God yes. ordained. Yeah. Yeah. That there is no serendipity, that it's really mm -hmm. the work in him. It's really. Mm -hmm. um, as we get ready to close our conversation, Sonia, um, you know, one of the things that I have just really appreciated about you is just your authenticity that, you know, on Facebook, you have just been real where you have been like, look, I'm having a hard time. Pray for me, but God is good. You know, it it has been literally like the humanness of Sonia and the the the, the spirit of God, and like we mm -hmm. see it. And mm -hmm. I think that that's such a healthy picture that we need to see leaders talk about it. Um, and so I'm so grateful that you haven't just put a mask on, or maybe have you the mask? Yeah, yeah, the mask. It's there. There is a mask there because okay. I'm sure everything that I'm feeling and seeing, you'll never see it. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to work through it because I believe what God said. And, you know, I, I if I can share with you this yeah. particular scripture in Revelations yeah. 3 and 2 that says. Um, it says. 
says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Mm -hmm. Be watchful and strengthen the things. Don't get so caught up in your grief. Work with what you have left. He didn't take everything. He left you. He left you. He didn't take everything. He left you with so much more. You know, and um, that that's what I, with, with uh, whatever I have left, I'm going to work and build on strengthening that. I'm going to work on giving power to what I have left. And a, a, a clear picture is Job. Job lost everything, even his health. Almost lost his wife who was crazy and nagging him. <laughs> but he got everything double, triple. He got it back. Because he gave, he relinquished his life to to um, to God, and he just didn't, he just didn't let that um, take over him. You Wonderful. know. Yep, I love that. I've I've never thought about that, but that is that's a great scripture to strengthen what remains. So God hasn't, he, he hasn't take taken everything. everything. Mm -hmm. He hasn't taken everything. Uh, Sonia, I know that it's a hotline over there. You're a popular lady. You got people calling and buzzing. And they call it, I think they're calling because they're probably not able to get in here. And I had sent it out that it was going to be there. I don't know if that's why, because it's the same two people that keep calling my sister. But can I just give you, and I know you got to sign off. Can I just share this, first, this Thessalonians text? Yes, yes. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Mm -hmm. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, in Christ Jesus is the key. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you cannot rejoice always. You cannot pray continually. You will no way give thanks to everything because that stuff just don't seem right. Why should I rejoice and give thanks in this circumstance? My son, I'm supposed to not bury him. He's supposed to bury me. But you rejoice. You give yourself with a renewed spirit and your faith renewed. Be ye renewed. Be not conformed to the things of this world, but be renewed. Be renewed in the spirit of God. And that's why you're able to do it. <coughs> that's why that's what uh the text that came to me and then i just i know you got to go but my mother i watched her and i watched my mother-in-law and my mother used to talk out loud to god and that's i have that in my ringtone that's what wakes me up i'll never leave you i'll never forsake you i'll be with you always and my mother would say you said it, didn't you? Didn't you say you would be with me always? I'm counting on you, God. Yeah. So when you, uh, I heard that in my mom and I watched that in my mother-in-law. I watched that in my father. They fought to the end and they relinquished their lives to Christ. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, having me and I had prepared so much like I was going to be preaching or something. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to have some uh, some things to fall back on, you know, for if, in place of a loss of words. Yeah. Well, I, I never believed that you would ever be at a loss for words mm -hmm. ever. So. But people is... should not be so weary and frustrated in what is going on struggling because it's all temporary. And don't be so weary that you forget to be, to stay watchful. Yeah. To be watchful, to, to also know that in this suffering, you can be a highlight or light for somebody else that's suffering because they see you walking through this journey and then it helps to build somebody else up. Wonderful. What's well, something here? Yeah, Call, I, blow the horn on me, huh? I, I appreciate you for sharing um, your experience and just having a conversation, you know, with us. Like I said, I think you're definitely a bright light. Um, and it is just obvious that your faith is what is keeping you. 
Um, and so I'm going to ask for you to just close us out with a short prayer. Okay. And um, yeah, we'll just close out that way in prayer. All right, eyes closed, heads bowed. Father God, I pray that any, any and all of your children that are grieving at this moment, I pray that you would comfort them with the comfort that you give. I pray, Lord, that you would stand and send supportive people into their lives so that they know they don't have to carry this burden alone, Lord, Father God. But mostly, Father God, I pray that they sense your presence that you will, and that that will help them to meditate on what is true. Help them to know that you are God and you care deeply for them so much that you are say you are saving each little tear that they shed. I pray this that in Jesus' precious and holy name, that you will give a special portion of love and comfort and peace to those that are suffering through this pandemic, those that are suffering not only with the COVID, but have sick ones that they're not even able to go see. We can't even fellowship with Christmas. This is a prime time of the Christian life is to share love and to share with our family and friends. And we have been, it's been stopped. We just can't go through with it, but Lord, you know, and you have a time set on this thing. You said in your word, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Help us to wait on you and know that it is you that we move and have our very being. It's in the matchless and penetrating name of Jesus the Christ. We give you honor and we give you glory. And all the people of God and all of the saints all over the world and all over this Facebook recording say together, amen. 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 God bless you, Sonia. Thank right. you so much. Have a okay. good rest of the day, okay? All righty. Thank All you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, you guys, I pray that you've been blessed by just this conversation with Sonia, who's a prayer warrior. She's a great woman of God, and she is just authentically walking out her grief, and she's doing it with the loving support of her husband and her family and her friends. So do me a favor and share this broadcast. And also, I want you to just stay connected because I'm going to have more and more of these pop-up conversations as we just really pull behind the mask of grief and really just talk about healing through conversations regarding grief. So you guys be blessed and have a great rest of the day.